Greetings. Hope y'all are doing well out there. And welcome to our inaugural live stream of the semester. We're about three weeks in now, or at the end of today, we'll be three weeks in. And we're just going to go over a couple of things, maybe some uh, deliverables, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, kick, kick, that you're working on. All right, one of the deliverables we have is the rhetorical situation profile. So you may have noticed this from last week, or I guess it's earlier this week. Sorry, I'm in like a next week mode. It is literally a wall o text. I know gasp. If there's a couple of things that you take away from this, know that one, you have some resources here on the bottom. So these links here from the Purdue Al, as well as this template here. So OneDrive link. Don't overthink this deliverable. There's a lot going on here, but this is all about practice as opposed to perfection. If you go down to the very last set of examples from the Purdue Al, they're right down here and you go to number three, it's the grocery list one. So we're focused on the rhetorical situation and the four elements or aspects that go with that. So we're thinking about audience purpose. Those are our two primary ones. I hope that uh, towards the end of this class and as we progress in writing projects, this becomes more and more automatized, right? Like it's just automatic. So we come down here. We know that the audience is being described. They don't have it broken down like we've done in class where we have primary, secondary, tertiary. And sometimes grocery list audiences are pretty narrow, right? If it's only for yourself, you are the one writing it and you're also the primary audience. If for instance, you lived with a roommate or maybe you uh, are running errands for a family member or something like that or a friend, then you might not be the author and the primary audience. And this is, again, sort of the thing that we, I think, or I did at least, beat the dead horse dead in class with, where if you, you could write, if you were the writer or the author, and you're also the primary audience of a grocery list, you can write down in pretty shorthand just, you know, milk, eggs, chicken, beef, whatever, and you know exactly what you're going to get. Like You can visualize it in your mind. But if, for instance, you gave that to a roommate or a friend or a family member, you may or may not get back exactly what you want. And so in that case, we would kind of tailor this list then to our primary or secondary audience, you know, what their needs, wants, expectations are. Uh, the purpose of a grocery list, again, like, don't overthink this. Uh, Captain Obvious is sometimes your best friend when we're breaking this down. And it's to get what you want, like, the primary purpose of a resume is to make it rank in interview, however you want to conceive of that, right, to get the job just as a grocery list is to acquire sustenance. Because the last time I checked, humans, I don't know, kind of needed, you know, that thing called sustenance to survive. The other items that we're looking at here, outside of audience and purpose, these are our two primary ones. We'd be looking at authors. So again, this is sort of like reverse engineering social media profiles. So what do we know about the writer? Uh, if we went back over to the kitchen window, let's see if we can't pull this example up. Sunday. Oh, it's the first one here, right on the side. All right. So I don't know if this is ringing any bells for you. Uh <laughs> Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. But we're kind of reverse engineering what Laura B. Weiss is saying here. Like, what do we know about her as an author? She has a little profile down here that we can kind of uh, look at. I think there's a little bit to... Uh... All 
OK, maybe not. Check it. We have a little blurb here. Another way to kind of think about what you know about the author is you can reverse engineer this from the audience and also the outlets she's publishing in. So her work has been the New York Times, uh, Travel and Leisure, Food Network. And so if you think who the primary audiences of those outlets are, that gives a little bit of insight into what we know uh, about her as an author, or it could. One of the ones we brought up is where... Let's see if we can just control F or command F this. I'm on, a, I'm on PC today, so, you know, getting my pinky finger workout instead of my thumb, like on a Mac. So if we uh, Google grill, duh, right? So she's grilling pineapple, she's grilling peaches, and then, you know, we can't forget the, uh, the bacon, crumbled bacon, bacon crumbles down here. And the question was, would Laura B. Weiss put pineapple on pizza? And I think it's safe to assume here that if she be grilling them pineapples, be grilling them peaches and cr putting bacon crumbles on top of ice cream, mm, yeah, it, it might be a, an indication. The next is text. This element or aspect called text is not literally the letters and the digits or it's not solely confined to that. We're thinking maybe more about the modality or the medium of what it's being written on. So again, Captain Obvious is your best friend here. And it says the text is the grocery list itself. So this could be on the back of a receipt. It could be on a napkin or, you know, like the back of an envelope or something like that. Partly you're describing what the text, like literally what the text is. When we get to food memoir, again, if we go, uh, I wanted to read this one. That's why it's here. But if we go back to the Sunday one, we're saying, all right, we are on a digital page of NPR. The series is called Kitchen Window. And we have available to us images. We can hyperlink things out. These are going to recipes. We also have available uh, to us icons and graphs and charts that wouldn't be possible, for instance, on a paper-based receipt or envelope or something like that, you know, if we're going back to the grocery list example. Or even within the grocery list itself, if we think that the medium that the list is being written on, it could be in Apple Notes or uh, Google Tasks or maybe you're putting it on uh, Ms. A., I don't want to trigger my uh, smart device, so I call her Ms. A, or wherever it may lie. You have different uh, affordances, for instance, uh, on Notes or even on Google Tasks, I think it is. I forget what the Note app is on Android. Sorry, y'all. You could take pictures or images, and you can import and kind of cut things in there that you don't have available to you, you know, in a hand analog, handwritten kind of modality. This is, in essence, a very long-winded way of saying there's two ways to do this. You should, in theory, have 7 to 10. I finally got the number right, y'all. 7 to 10 food memoirs. And you can take, of those 7 to 10, select maybe, you know, like 2 or 3, and you can build profiles out for each of those memoirs. So you'd have 2 to 3 all day. Or you can look at your entire collection and make some generalizations. So what broadly are the elements or the uh, items, you know, about the audience that the seven to 10 share in common and so on and so forth. Again, the main purpose here is practice. If you do take a uh, scenic route, that's fine. And it may lead to you gaining a deeper knowledge of the thing you're trying to learn, you know, whether that was audience, text, purpose, writer, whatever, it, you know, whatever aspect of the uh, rhetorical situation you were looking at. At the end of the day, 
this profile or the profiles you create will feed into your rough draft. The other thing that we're looking at is a series of drafts. And again, if this rolls in, let's say Sunday night, I'm totally fine with that. Some of y'all have begun the, uh, the process of starting these, you know, kind of baby stepping it. Not everybody's schedule is the same, but you do have a little bit of latitude with this. For this one, again, you will consult your collection of food memoirs, the 7 to 10, and you have the same two options here. You can either choose one food memoir and then within that one food memoir. So if, for instance, let's say we got uh, the how to sesame treats, like wonk wonk, open a can of tahini. If you wanted to use this one memoir or this one article to locate all of your devices, that's totally fine. Another way that you could do this instead of doing one by one by one or a specific one is you could look at, again, all of the articles in your collection and identify what the most common appeals are. My guess is that pathos is going to be a very strong rhetorical appeal or rhetorical strategy in this genre. So if you're seeing this come up more often than the others, that'd be something you might note. This part, again, is practice. It doesn't have to be perfect, and it might be a little bit of a challenge. A genre that we're familiar with is online reviews. So this may be Amazon or it may be, you know, whatever websites you go to for clothes, or it could be Yelp as well. When you're thinking about how does a review factor into my decision making when it comes to purchasing a product? You know, it could be uh, a dress or a new pair of jeans, shoes. Uh, I don't know what else is in your, what else, you know, is in your Amazon carts. I don't know, maybe a gimbal. I just bought a gimbal. I know, bad. Ugh. Gear acquisition syndrome, gas, it's a real thing. What reviews are making it in to your decision making? And when you can answer that question, kind of break it down, you're like, okay, am I identifying general themes? You know, many people are saying that, oh, this uh, pair of jeans runs a size too big or a size too small. And if you notice trends in that, that's one way that it factors in. So for instance, this would be either in the rhetorical situation profile or in our device drafts where you're looking at your entire collection and you're identifying these uh, overarching themes. You know, that's something that you're also doing in everyday life. If you were to look at an individual review by review or article by article, you might think about what are the metrics or the aspects or the data that are important to you? If something doesn't have a picture, are you more likely to trust it or not? If it doesn't have thumbs up or... People didn't find that the review was very helpful. Does that influence your decision on whether you trust it or the degree to which you trust it? In essence, we're trying to make a judgment call on whether a review is useful or credible to us. So a part of writing an online review that will be used by many people is establishing ethos. So people who will never meet you in real life have no clue who you are, but only read your review or are able to use it to inform or help make a decision wherever they may be purchasing. So one way, for instance, you might establish credibility in an online review is with a picture. And in some areas or shops, it may be more heavily weighted or not. Clothes, for instance, I would guess that when you look at a model 
wearing the clothes, it doesn't really give you like the sense of what it would look like unless you also are a model. And then maybe then IDK. But if you see other people who aren't under, you know, like studio lighting conditions and behind a medium format camera, you get a sense of what does it look like if I'm in my bedroom, natural light coming in from the window and I shoot this, um, you know, on an iPhone. So it gives you a different perspective or maybe like what it would look more like in real life. And then this picture being included in the review might count or be weighted more heavily in your decision to trust it or not. We're doing the same thing, but with food memoirs. So what are the elements that we are valuing as individuals and at large for the general audience members who are consuming this genre? I thought we might do a couple of these together, or I mean together. You can watch me read these, and then I'll walk you through kind of my thought process in reading this, and hopefully that will help you figure out how to do this. I don't know. We'll find out, huh? If you go back to our genre sample page, there's a archive of all things we're cooking all of these articles are linked out, as well as the kitchen window ones. You're, of course, welcome to find food memoirs in other places as well. These ones tend to be pretty short, and there's a pretty large selection. So I'm trying to do a little bit of the, uh, the lifting with you, right? Because work smarter, not harder. As we're going through this, I wanted, I haven't gotten the opportunity to read all of these. And this one looked kind of interesting. It uh, caught my eye because of sesame treats. It reminded me very randomly of these little sesame balls. They're like deep fried donut sesame balls that are sold in Japan. I don't know. They're like 80 cents ish a piece. And I used to pick them up sometimes on my way back from work a little bakery in the train station. Uh, they're really delicious. I guess I had a sweet tooth craven. And then tahini is always good. I always enjoy this ingredient. So that's kind of what drew me in from the title. And then the picture, I don't know. It wasn't really that interesting to me, but the title was. So when we're thinking about how can we get clicks, how can we drive engagement in this genre we have available to us like YouTube, text, so titles are a way, so clickbait titles are a way to grab attention, whether it gets clicks or not is another thing, but that's one thing to keep in mind uh, about the, the text of this genre, what affordances we have to draw people in. Images also are a way, so even though this is just a, a static image or maybe like a stock photography, or I guess Dina did this for NPR, so it's not stock photography, she uh, had some original stuff just like thumbnails are to YouTube, right? Like these are the two, typically two primary things that will draw us into a video or not. Get the clicks, feed the algorithm, right? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and uh, affiliate link and discount code in the description below. After we get through the top part, I'm looking for I Spy. This is the way that my brain is kind of going to do this. So I'm gonna, as I'm reading through this, I'm thinking, hmm, okay, do I spy a logos you those pathos? Again, these don't happen individually, or they're not like mutually exclusive from one another. Like sometimes you'll kind of have an interesting interweaving of the devices together. For this activity, we're kind of arbitrarily splitting them apart, but know that in real life, they're not mutually exclusive. The other thing I'm also thinking about, it's not specific in our instruction set, but I'm drawing on a little bit of genre awareness and genre knowledge. So awareness is sort of like if you play video games, you have, uh, you know, whether you're on console or you're on a PC, 
you have a general sense of how games in a particular genre, like if I were to hop into uh, or hop onto Twitch and uh, stream me getting pwned in a COD lobby, you may not play COD, but if you're familiar with uh, FPSs, then you'd know kind of a, a little bit about the genre and how it operates. So if you were to switch to like Fortnite or to Destiny or something, it, it may be new to you, but you're not starting from scratch. So it's the same thing in writing that your kind of collective experience across different genres can help you understand new ones. Genre knowledge is very specific to the genre at hand. I have not written a lot of food memoirs. I've read a few of them, just a few, you know? So that can kind of help. But generally here, it's more like genre awareness. So I'm thinking to myself, where is the beginning the middle and the end of this piece so you can kind of scroll through and you know how do you know where one thing starts and the other thing ends a title or you know a tag like opinion or essay or whatever other tag like recipe might be a way to signal the beginning of something right and then you have the title that kind of indexes that uh date time author picture so you know this is where it's sort of beginning And then I'm going to think, okay, so now we're actually down to the body, like the copy of the article. I need to figure out where the beginning, the middle, and the end of this is. So I'm just kind of scrolling through, and here we go. I see a whole bunch of paragraphs, and then I see uh, a title again, an image, a little bit of a, of a blurb here, and then a recipe, a little bit more writing, Another title, another image, blurb, recipe, rinse, repeat. What this is telling me is that there's two sections. There's a part that's telling us about the dish, and there's a part that is giving us how to make dishes. So there's a kind of memoir part of this and there's a recipe or recipes part of this so everything that goes from greens and teeny boric down is going to be the recipe section and again like visual rhetoric wise like repetition 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 right so if we're drawing on contrast repetition line and proximity are crap principles whenever i see something like this it's in bold sans serif font and then an image little blurb it's probably going to index for me that a new recipe is coming up so if we scroll in again lo and behold we have the same sort of format here but at large when we start with this green tahini and borek one all the way down to the bottom i know that these are going to be you know a set of three or four recipes so recipes are one chunk and then the other chunk of this is the memoir and it's, I don't know, let's count together here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight paragraphs. So once I have this broadly split up between a memoir part and a recipe part, I'm going to come back to the top and say, okay, in these eight paragraphs, where is the beginning, the middle, and the end? And not to be too Captain Obvious on all y'all, but I'm kind of guessing that the first paragraph is where the uh, the memoir bit is going to begin. And probably the last paragraph right before the recipe section is where it's going to end. So now we just have to kind of parse out where the middle is. But in our quest now to identify where the beginning or the introduction is, I'm thinking, all right, what is the purpose of an introduction broadly? <laughs> Like, there's going to be a little bit of variance or difference from genre to genre to genre to genre. The way you might open a cover letter or a job application letter versus uh, something like this uh, opinion piece or a food memoir or, you know, a blog entry or an article in the Times is going to be different, right? The moves are going to be different, but there may be some overlap in purpose, and, may, and maybe moves too. I'm thinking introduction-wise, something needs to keep me engaged, right? Like feed the algorithm, get my click, keep my eyeballs on the screen for as long as you can. 
you might label this as a hook, an attention getter, uh, engagement drawer. I'm just making words up now. I mean, IDK. I really have no <laughs> what I'm talking about. Just making, making up words, making up words, y'all. But in this, I have a series of purposes in mind, right? So like a hook would be a purpose or a function that uh, a move is trying to accomplish, right? Because they're functional units that accomplish right? My definition of a genre move is uh, it's a chunk of language that gets done. Meep. So one of the things that it gets done is to draw attention, hold your eyeballs, get your clicks, however you want to imagine that. The next thing that I would expect it to do is to provide me a little bit of background or context about what the topic is and uh, kind of answer like a so what, right? Like, where are we going with this? Why should I read? And then what's going to come? If we're focusing it a little bit more for a food memoir specifically, so this is more in the area of genre knowledge, I'm thinking, okay. We know that this genre takes something that's very accessible, like food in this case is pretty accessible to most people because ice cream, you scream, you finish the line, that's universally accessible to people. So we're talking about food as a, as a medium or a means to be accessible to people. And then against that backdrop is something that's really personal and unique to you. So you know that there's this kind of balancing act in the genre. So I'm kind of looking for that in the introduction as well. So if we're here and it says, if you were going to make a dessert island, List of your four... Wow, sometimes I cannot read English. Can I just translate this into Japanese? <laughs> Anyone help? If you were going to... Yeah, we're going to do another take, right? Ugh. Also, sidebar, when we get to the podcast stage bit, if you do flub a copy like I just did, I would highly encourage you just to stop and STFU because when you go back and post and look at the waveform, it's a flat line, and it's so, so much easier to edit out. Anyways, we're going to start the third take here. If you were going to make a dessert island list for your refrigerator, it's unlikely tahini would make the cut. Okay. What is the purpose of this sentence? Like, what are we trying to do? In the context of an introduction, I know that I need my attention to be engaged, I want some background information. I want to know what your personal story is. So it's like the so what question, and then what's going to come next. So we start with a hypothetical. I love the dessert island list for your refrigerator. That's kind of drawing me in. I'm like, okay, eat cake for breakfast, right? It's unlikely that tahini would make the cut. So you've kind of got our attention. So one, maybe you know what tahini is and you're in the know, but if you don't, anticipation is like half the fun, right? So I'm expecting that we're going to find out what in the world this ingredient is. Spoiler alert, it's delicious and it's sesame. In fact, it might not even be in your standard mainland refrigerator, so... This is kind of a fun sentence, right? Because what does it mean to be standard in mainland refrigerator? Uh, unless you regularly cook food with a Middle Eastern or hippie influence, right? So this is doing a lot of complex work right now. One, it indexes kind of for me, like, what is standard mainland refrigerator? So I'm kind of thinking, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, bottles do you have on the inside door of your refrigerator, Ketchup, mayonnaise, bleh, it's like an abomination of a, of a condiment. I'm just saying, like, fight me on this. Ketchup, mustard, these sort of accoutrements. Uh, and then here it says, unless you regularly cook food with the Middle Eastern or hippie influence. So I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Uh, these are kind of indexing like target audience, right? So you're probably one of these people that is still building up anticipation for what tahini is. We know a little bit more is being revealed here. So if you cook hippie food, whatever that is, whatever that cuisine, according to um, Dina is, uh, or Middle Eastern food, again, like, is 
sort of nondescript, but it's narrowing us in a little bit, which is a bit of a shame. Okay, because Tahini is quite lovely and capable of much more than we give it credit for. All right, so I have an idea now that you're building up this anticipation. I want to know what Tahini is. You've given us some breadcrumbs, and now I'm getting a little bit frustrated. You know, like, just tell us what it is. So, next paragraph. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of making its acquaintance, ooh, bougie that is, mm-mm, or if you have, haven't looked too closely at the ingredients list, did, on the label of your jar, tahini is nothing more than sesame paste. Amen. Finally. It took us like five sentences to get a definition. So there's like a fine line, right, between building up anticipation for something and then like unnecessarily drawing this out. I think there's like a, a good balance here. I was getting a little bit frustrated, like Loki. There's a version made with toasted seeds, which is the best, fight me, uh, for a deeper flavor or a slightly blonder, more neutral tasting raw tahini. It has some of the richness of a nut butter with a looser texture and a subtler flavor. All right, so here's what I'm seeing. First part, this is giving us a hypothetical, right? So this is like building it. It's like hyping it, hyping us up. It's building uh, this anticipation for something. So if this is evoking, you know, anticipation, like it's building some excitement, some hype around this. Yeah, I'm going to label this as uh, a pathos. One way, again, sorry to be, not be coherent, you know, spicy water. One way to do this is to identify purpose, right? So I'm drawing on genre awareness. So it's like your knowledge of different written genres help figure out this one. But now more specifically, we're looking at genre knowledge and genre moves. So we know that an introduction has to, you know, a bullet list that we have to fulfill of purposes, like get our attention, give us some background information or some context, and then, you know, tell us kind of, so what, make your case, like the quote unquote, like thesis statement, if you want to envision it that way. And then, you know, like roadmap it for us, what's coming next. So if we reverse engineer from purposes, then we can start to slap on, you know, where the tools that are getting us or accomplishing that purpose. It's six of one half dozen of the other, what, whatever makes the most sense to all the else. So those are the multiple appeals that I'm seeing going on here. And, you know, they're just associated with different genre moves. Right, because genre moves are chunks of language that get done. And, you know, getting done is kind of like purpose, right? And rhetorical appeals, rhetorical strategies, rhetorical devices are means to that end of, you know, aka getting done. So, meep. All right, so moving on. There can be a bit of confusion about what you're referring to as we tend to use the term tahini for both the paste itself and the lemony garlicky sauce made from it. Fun facts. Beyond stirring the paste into a batch of hummus, also delicious, hashtag girl dinner, this sauce is frequently the only way we enjoy tahini. Tahini, okay, so this is kind of like, again, nice background information. It's kind of paralleling what's going on right here. You know, this is probably not in your standard mainland refrigerator, but now we're talking about, you know, general Middle Eastern or like general hippie kind of uses of tahini, right? And it's kind of setting us up and saying that the use is kind of boring. It's a little bit narrow and we're building anticipation again. So I'm kind of hoping that you're going to hit me with some new and original, you know, applications for this beautiful sauce. All right. Tahini sauce is lashed onto. That's so violent. It's like picking up a giant paintbrush and dipping it into a jar of tahini and just, you know, just wham, lashing it on there like a cat o' nine tails. Probably not the verb that I would use, but you do you. Lashed onto falafel, also delicious, adding a tangy, uh, a soppy counterpoint to the crunchy fried patties. Okay, that's some nice description going on there. Dig it. Also, always in favor, right, of like contrast and texture, contrast and flavor. Mmm, good times. 
Or if we're feeling a bit more adventurous, tahini sauce is paired with quinoa or tofu for healthier salads. What? Like, I kind of can't imagine putting tahini on quinoa. I can think of a friend who would do that, but I don't know if I'd be that adventurous. But if you start looking towards those cuisines, you know, whatever those are referential to, that are more familiar with the... Oh, okay, gotcha. It's forward-looking here. Lebanese, Turkish, Armenian, etc. You'll find that it can go far beyond falafel. Okay, so you're, like, belaboring the point a little bit here, right? Like, you're hyping us up and saying, like, here's common usage or ones that you may be familiar with if you, you know, cook Middle Eastern food or if you cook hippie food. And now... We're kind of getting into this. Uh, In much of the Middle East, tahini is seen as more of a workhorse building block than a niche condiment. Okay. It's used in hummus and falafel. Okay, so again, like referencing above, sure. But, okay, so nice contrast here. It's uh, almost used in the same way we'd use butter or mayonnaise. Adding heft to both savory and sweet preparations. That's interesting that you can have uh, savory and sweet. Tahini never hides its nutty nature, so it doesn't quite disappear from the in the same subtle way those other ingredients would. But the rich flavor can be surprisingly delicious in these new contexts and a boon to those who want the luxuriousness, that's a fun word, but don't want dairy. As you can see from opening any jar or can of tahini, there is... This is not a low-fat product. It's swirling with deliciously rich oil, but that's precisely why it works so well in so many contexts, adding depth to baked dishes and cold salads alike. And other nut and seed butters, tahini's fats, are those good fats the omegas we've encountered or we're encouraged to consume. It also contains trace minerals, fiber, and calcium. More than that, it's just plain good. So try expanding your tahini horizons, swirl it into sweetbread or ladle it. See, I would have used that verb up there instead of lashed, right? Like ladle on falafel or baked fish or really whatever you want. Sure, tahini may never make your dessert island list, but it can find a home in a surprising range of dishes. All right, so that's it. Eight paragraphs deep. Let's figure out where the beginning, the middle, and the end is. And then how do you know where those are? So this is kind of these last two paragraphs or this is like the uh, pre-ending, right? We're transitioning into the end. And then this is giving us, the conclusion is kind of giving us a call to action, right? It may, so it's kind of a nice way to wrap it up. You have dessert island list on the top and then you have dessert island list on the bottom. Like I appreciate that. So one way to identify the introduction, the conclusion from the body is the introduction probably is going to be the first couple of things that you see. And so it's figuring out where the introduction ends more so than where it starts. If you see something that's repeated, you know, uh, at the top, at the bottom, that can give you some insights where the conclusion is kind of beginning. I appreciate that. And then we just have a call to action, right? You should really try it in these sort of applications. It sets up the recipes below. The, uh, the top part, okay, so because tahini is quite lovely and capable and much more, we usually give it uh, credit for uh, blah, 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 blah. This is where it kind of takes us, right, to the setup. So we're saying maybe the uh, introduction part is like right here. We're getting a little bit of engagement, right, for the hype building, getting a little bit of context about what it is, and then finally a definition of what tahini is, you know, if you're not in the know. The middle part is kind of from here down to here, these uh, few paragraphs, I don't know, four paragraphs. And if we break that down a little bit further, right, there's uh, an introduction of this is how it's typically used. So again, it's kind of paralleling that hype building for us to then 
pivot and say, here are some other applications that tahini is an ingredient you might not know, or it's not on your like desert island. I kept saying dessert, huh? I guess I'm just like really hungry for sweet foods right now. I just now noticed that this is desert island list. Sometimes I speak English, y'all. Sometimes. You know, that's probably not on your desert island list, but in other places, you know, it's like a staple like mayonnaise or ketchup is to us. So that's kind of a nice pivot. So this is sort of the uh, setup for the body. And then this is the uh, the punch, right? And then as we get down to the last two, it kind of wraps it up and concludes with a call to action. So in a nutshell, as we're almost an hour deep now of me just pontificating into the abyss. Genre is your best friend. It's just your best friend. There's a lot of genres, like written genres, you're very familiar with and do every single day. So embrace your inner Captain Obvious and let that experience and knowledge help you figure out new ones and figure out, you know, like what the actual is going on. So rely on your genre awareness and then build your genre knowledge, right? What is unique about this genre of food memoir? When we're again looking at genre awareness, we're thinking about where are we in the beginning, middle, end? So an introduction across different genres is gonna share some purposes in common, right? So if we need to engage people or draw attention, we need to provide a context, so what, what's coming next? They're doing that here. So when you can start to highlight where those are, you know, like where is the hype building beginning? Where's the hype building ending? That is a function, that is a purpose, and rhetorical devices, strategies, appeals, however you want to envision them, are a means to that end, right, of getting shit done. That's one way to think about this. Think about where you are, beginning, middle, end, what the typical purposes are, and then we can, you know, go more fine-grained and zoom in so we can start to identify moves, the chunks of language that get done. And then we can slap on appeals to those. So this is how I would do this uh, little blurb here of how to get sesame treats. Open a can of whoop. And by that, I mean tahini. you. I hope y'all have a fantastical Friday. Good luck on your deliverables. If you, uh, you know, haven't turned in the profile one, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge, kick, kick, I uh, invite you with open arms to turn that in ASAP. As for the uh, three drafts, this is practice, y'all. You may get some things a little bit wrong, and that's okay. Because I think that when we sometimes make mistakes, they are also awesome opportunities for learning. You're not going to get penalized for this either. You put in good faith effort, I give you all the points, and then you do the learning, right? At the end of the day, all of our deliverables, the uh, profile and also your devices, are going to help form the content of your shitty first draft. So we're going to do an exercise of, of basically copy-paste from what you're doing here to help set you up for the next deliverable. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, raves, or rants, drop me a DM, shoot me an email, or meet us back here in office hours. Toodaloo. Wow. I did not mean to anime wow that. I was looking for this one.